Okay, um, today we're going to start section two of the chapter on electron configurations. Um, electron configurations are just showing how electrons fill into those um, energy states that we looked at yesterday. So let's get started on this. We don't care about their, early, their first slide. Um, they give us three rules of how to put electrons into the energy states. Remember we had level one with sublevel 1s with one orbital in there. And then level 2 had sublevel 1s, sublevel 2s, and then there were different orbitals in those things. All right, so we had all these orbitals to work with. Where do you put the electrons? Um, that's what an electron configuration is going to show us. Okay, so an electron configuration is just showing how the electrons are arranged. They say around the nucleus here. Well, that's kind of implying they're particle-like, and we don't know that. Um, it is really describing how they're arranged energetically around the nucleus, what energy states they're in. Okay, so there's going to be three rules that we use to figure this out. The Aufbau principle, which comes from a German uh, verb, Aufbau, meaning to build up. We're going to build up off of previous configurations. The Pauli exclusion principle, named after Wolfgang Pauli, and Hund's rule, dealing with electron spins. So. Let's look back at this. Now, I know yesterday I just drew it 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d on top of each other. They're kind of spreading them out a little bit. Now, notice level 1 has 1s in it, and there's the 1s orbital. Electrons can go in there. I guess the big question is how many electrons can go in there? Just 1, 2, 3, 4, 100? We'll have to figure that out. Level 2 has 2s and then it has 2p. Notice there's only one 2s orbital. There's three different 2p orbitals. Okay, so um, again, we're going to have to figure out how electrons go into those things. Then level 3s has uh, one orbital. 3p has three orbitals. 3d over here has five orbitals. Now after that, you go to level 4. 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f. They're going up at, at an angle here, but that's fine. Now, notice something interesting, though. Now, first of all, they, they go on to 5s, p, d, f, and g are up there, too, if you really care. We're not going to use them. 6s, p, d, and so on are up there. But notice something interesting here that I didn't tell you about yesterday. Level 1, level 2, level 3 are looking fine so far. 3s, 3p, 3d, but then 4s, notice they overlap each other. Now, if you'll recall yesterday when I was drawing this, I kind of separated them from each other and I warped my lines so that they didn't overlap each other because I wanted to show all the level 3s together, all the level 4s together, and so on. But in reality, the atom doesn't get a chance to do that. So these energy sublevels overlap each other. Level 1 is fine way down here. Level 2 is fine down here. Level 3 spreads out SPD. So much so that when level 4 above it spreads out, 4s actually ends up being down here, it's hard to see on this, but slightly below 3d. Okay, So what does that mean? If you're looking at low energy, going from lowest to highest, obviously 1s is the lowest energy of them all. And then 2s, 2p, then 3s, then 3p. Now, you would expect after 3p, the next highest energy is going to be 3d. But in reality, because these levels, the sublevels overlap each other, after 3p, level 4s is the next, the next lowest one. And then 3d and then 4p. Now notice after 4p, you might want to go to 4d, but 5s goes underneath it again. So you see how they start getting all jumbled up, up in here. And it gets to be a real mess trying to figure out what's the next level up. After I do 4D, what's the next highest level that the electrons are going to go into? Kind of a jumbled mess, isn't it? So what we do is something the book doesn't really show you clearly here, but we come up with something called the, the diagonal rule to help us remember the order in which these are filled. Now, since this is now an online course, you can always just look up the diagrams. But for completeness sake, I'd like you to be able to see this diagonal rule and what it looks like. Um, so... I have, let me find it here, um, a picture that I just found on Wikimedia Commons so, um, of, of what we call the diagonal rule. Notice we write just across a piece of paper, level 1s, level 2s, 2p. So I'm writing my levels across the, the page, 3s, 3p, 3d. 
each line of the page is a new level, level four, level five, level six, and so on. And then each level adds a new thing. One has S, two has SP, three has SPD, four has SPDF, and so on. Five technically has something beyond the F. We call it a 5G. But again, electrons aren't going to go in there on a normal periodic table configuration, so we don't have to worry about it. Now, make sure when you draw this, you line all the S's on top of each other, all the P's on top of each other, and so on. Because once you do that, you can just draw these diagonal arrows that they show in red. And then you simply follow the arrow. You first fill level one, uh, sub-level 1S. When you're done with that, you go to the next arrow and fill 2S. After that, you fill 2P and then 3S. Now notice that's just following the normal progression, filling level 1, then 2, then starting 3. But watch when we get to the next arrow. After 3S, the next arrow goes 3P, and then you go down and do 4S instead of doing 3D over here. From 3P, you go over to 4S, following the arrow down. And that agrees with what I told you about the jumbling overlap of the levels just uh, in, in the PowerPoint. After 4S, you go to the next arrow. Now you come back and get that 3D that you thought you might have filled first, but you don't. And then after 3D, you go down and fill 4P and then 5S. Notice you'll leave behind the remainder of 4 for the moment. After 4P, you go to 5S. Now you've finished filling 5S, you can fill 4D, 5P, 6S, and so on. Notice a consequence of that. If you're filling up level 1, you just do 1S. You're filling up level 2, 2S, 2P. You're filling up level 3, 3S, 3P. You go to 4S before you fill in 3D. And it's going to happen again. After 4P, you go to 5S, then go to 4D. Notice the D is filled one level behind. When you're filling up level 3, you go down and start level 4 before you finish up 3D. Now that you're in level 4, you go down and, uh, and do 5S before you go back and fill up 4D. So S's and P's are always filled up correctly. Whatever level you're in, you're filling the S's and the P's. The D's are always filled one level behind. So if you're in level 5, you go back and fill up 4D. Um, the F's, notice, are going to be filled two levels behind. You do 4D, 5P, 6S. Then you go back and do 4D, two levels behind. So, or 4F, two levels behind. Ds are always filled one level behind where you're working. Fs are always filled two levels behind where you're working. And that becomes important eventually, obviously, like everything else does. So, let's continue with this. So here's our orbital diagram. We want to know how to fill it up. Okay, great. They jumble up. We have a diagonal rule to help us remember how they're jumbled up. Notice that diagonal rule really isn't a law of physics or anything like that. It's simply a memory device to help us remember the order in which they're jumbled. Um, again, since you're doing this online, you can easily just look it up. Um, but if you're ever stranded on a deserted island with, you know, without a, uh, an internet, you can always carve the diagonal rule in the sand and you'll know how to fill up your orbitals. Because what else would you do on a deserted island, right? Now, okay, so I guess the, the big question is now you, you got all these orbitals, you know how they're jumbled up. Okay, so let's start filling up electrons into these things. Let's take a hydrogen atom. Why hydrogen? It's the smallest atom. There's only one lousy electron in there, so it's the easiest one to work with. After we figure that out, we'll go to helium because now there's two electrons. We already know where the first one goes. We can just put the second one in. And so on and so on. And we can build up on what we know. From helium, we can go to lithium with three electrons and just add one more and so on. Um, we call that the building up principle. But since the guys who were working on this, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, Born, Dirac, um, well, Dirac wasn't, but most of them were German. And so instead of just calling it the building up principle, they use the German word Aufbau principle. And that's really all this Aufbau principle is. You start with the simplest atom and you build up from there. Now, that still leaves the question, okay, great, hydrogen, one lousy electron, where does it go? Well, lowest energy is down here, highest energy is up here. Just like teenagers, electrons are lazy. I know Hunter's going to yell at me for that. Um, so, um, 
electrons are lazy, they're going to the lowest energy state first. Um, that's down here in level 1s. So hydrogen, its electron is going to go down here in level 1s. Okay, good. So now we got it. What about helium? It's got two electrons. The first one goes in 1s. Where does the second one go? Well, if there's still room in level 1s, it's going to go in there as well. If there's not, it's going to have to go to 2s, the next highest state. So bottom line is for the Aufbau principle, it tells you fill the lowest level first. Keep cramming electrons in there, as many as are going to fit. And once you know it's full, now you start filling up the next level up, 2s. Cram electrons in there until it's full. And then once it's full, start filling in 2p. Notice there's more orbitals there, so it's going to take more electrons to fill it up. After that, go to 3s and fill it, and so on and so on, following the diagonal rule, following that jumbled up. So after you filled 3p, the next one you'd fill is 4s, and then 3d, and so on. So that's the Aufbau principle. You start at the lowest energy level possible, and you fill it up, and then you fill the next one, and so on and so on. Okay. The analogy I like to use is you come home from school and you walk in the living room, the couch is open, you lay on the couch. You've gone to the lowest energy state possible. If the couch is full, you got to sit on an easy chair. It's still not bad, but it's higher energy because you're sitting up now. If the easy chair is full, now you got to have a less comfortable, higher energy position. Sooner or later, you got to be standing in the corners way up here at very high energy and no one wants that. So that's the Aufbau principle. Okay, so again, go to fill up the lowest levels and work your way up. Now, um, that's that. Now, how many electrons fill up a level? That is going to be the Pauli exclusion principle. And I'm going to get interrupted in the, the middle of, of this, but that's okay. We'll continue it tomorrow. Um, the Pauli exclusion principle tells us how many electrons fit into one of those orbitals. And it turns out it's two. Okay. The reason why it's two is that electrons have spin states. They can be um, spinning two opposite directions. And I'll show you this, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Now, ignore that. We're not ready for that yet. So I'll do it down here in the corner. Um, think of the electron as a tiny little, whoops. Think of the electron as a tiny little particle like a planet. Electrons, just like planets, are spinning on their axis. So there's the axis. It's spinning around like that. Now, when it does so, it generates a magnetic field. If any of you guys are in electronics, you, you know about moving charges and magnetic fields. If it's spinning around in that direction, the north pole is pointing upward. So we say the electron is spin up. And in fact, you can see it right. I can't find my cursor. You can see it right here. We often draw it in our energy diagrams as a half arrow pointing upward. If the, and, and by the way, I would fill it right in here in level 1s. If the electron spins the other way, so there's the little electron planet, there's its axis spinning the other direction, then the magnetic field points downward, and we say it's spin down. And we will often draw it as a little half arrow pointing downward. Okay, so real quickly before I guess time runs out on me, I'll show you the first element or two and then we can move on from there. Well, tomorrow. Um, notice I have a, a blown up picture of that energy diagram, even with the stupid text because I was too lazy to get rid of it. Level 1s, okay, let's talk about the hydrogen atom. There's one electron. We'll draw our little half arrow pointing upward in that 1s. It should fit inside there, but I can't draw that small with my fingers. Um, and that's how electron, um, how hydrogen's electron configuration looks, 1s with one electron. Helium can fit another electron in there, spin down. So we got two electrons in there. Now, the Pauli exclusion principle basically says that that's all you can fit. You can't fit a third electron in there because there's no other spin state. If I put another one in there, it would have to be spin up, repeating this guy, or spin down, repeating that guy. And Pauli won't allow you to repeat spin states in an orbital. When you go on to AP chemistry, you'll learn why that's the case, having to do with magnetic field coupling. Um, but that's really it. So after two electrons, if I have a third one to work with, I would have to put it up here in level 2s and start filling that in. 
we'll look at that tomorrow.